Howdy, this is Mackenzie Franklin from Side Game LLC here in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And today we're going to be finishing off the top 50 solo board games of all time list, numbers 10 through 1, the 2022 edition. If you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please make sure that you do. It is the best way to help us grow. And for those of you already subscribed, thank you so much for the continuous support. That being said, let's get started at the list with number 10. My number 10 goes to Arkham Horror, the card game. This is a narrative-driven, scenario-based game where you're going to be taking investigators and fighting off the terrible mythos that are trying to stop you from fulfilling your objectives. You'll have some grand story that you're going on, and every time you play, you'll be setting up a scenario that has different locations that you'll explore, but before you do, you're going to create your own deck of cards and watch as it progresses from mission to mission. That's one of my favorite parts about this game is the way that your deck is going to level up. When you upgrade, you have two major choices to either upgrade cards that are already in your deck into better versions of themselves, like the magnifying glass here can become a stronger one. It's got a reduced cost as well as a new ability to bounce it back to your hand, or you can straight up just find amazing new powerful cards to add into your deck to replace your level zero cards. You have new artifacts, spells, abilities, allies. You have a lot of choices when it comes to upgrading your deck, and you'll pick that path before you even begin your journey or maybe cater to it based on the things that you discover throughout your story. Arkham Horror, the card game's creative scenario design, level up system, and simplified core action basis makes it for a compelling storytelling adventure that I'm excited to play again and again. Whenever a new scenario comes out, I'm curious to see what new things the mythos has to offer me. So that's my number 10, Arkham Horror, the card game. My number nine goes to A Feast for Odin, a worker placement game where you play as a tribe of Vikings. You're gonna be sending out your workers to collect stuff and then finding places for that stuff to go. This can come in two different forms. You can either put these things into your own personal board here, trying to fill it up and reduce the amount of negative points, or you can collect these different islands. And when you collect these islands, you'll be able to puzzle piece around these bonus areas. And that's one of my favorite parts about this game is the bonus system. I love how you can push your luck with the amount of different island tiles that you grab because you're trying to surround as many bonus actions as you get. And the islands have more exciting bonuses than your main game board. For example, this island here has the the ability to get you meat, fish, as well as your choice between rune stones as well as ore. And some islands can even give you these different sheds that give you even more spots to fill for different bonus abilities. I love this system and I love that you're always taking on a whole bunch of negative points. So this one has 22 negative points, but if you can get it filled by the end of your challenge, you can get a bunch of points back. And the solo system for this game is super manageable as well as very intuitive. You're going to be using two different colors of workers and when it's your turn, you're going to be placing them out and at the end of every round, you leave them there and then use your other color of workers. This means that you're essentially blocking yourself, which is going to push you to diversify your actions and make for very interesting gameplays where you'll be doing a lot of different varied things. And on top of all of that, you'll have these occupation cards that you'll be able to draw and play that will modify your actions further and give you your own special abilities and engines that you can abuse throughout the course of the game. A Feast for Odin's bonuses during production, occupation cards, as well as the action system as a whole, make it a solo sandbox experience that you can find yourself spending a lot of time in. And if you look on the BGG forums, there's also a solo campaign that's been fan created that's going to give you unique challenges that you can also participate in. I'll make sure to link that in the description below. Check it out if you enjoy A Feast for Odin or it's something that you're interested in. My number eight goes to That's Pretty Clever, but not just That's Pretty Clever, the whole series of these games. You got That's Pretty Clever, Twice as Clever, as well as Clever Cube. On your turn, you'll be taking a handful of dice, rolling them out, and then picking one of those dice to place into your player area. You'll use it to take an action, and then everything that was lower than that die's number will go into the center of the table onto this tray here. Those are dice you are no longer able to roll and use in future rolls. You'll do it again, take a die, repeat the process until you've taken three dice, and then the AI will take a turn. You'll roll all six dice, take the three lowest, put it on the tray, and then you'll use one of them to take an action. A very simple process with push your luck that makes sense, but is also a bit of a puzzle. Are you going to take a strong action now, but have fewer options in the future? This very simple choice is something that is gratifying and is something that you can easily understand and you'll be doing constantly as you evaluate the dice throughout the course of the game. In addition to the dice placement, my favorite part about this game is the combos that occur from playing the various mini games. When you take a colored die, you'll play a mini game in that colored section. For example, if you took the blue die here, you would add that to the white die and cross off the corresponding spot in this blue area. If you ever complete a row or column, you get a bonus 
and whatever's on the side here. Now that bonus may trigger another bonus in the other area and so on and so forth. And you'll be triggering these different symbols, accruing points and trying your hand at getting that high score, which you'll check on the back of the rule book. Each version of the game offers different mini games and different combinations of challenges, as well as different power ups that you can earn through these different bonus actions. And my favorite out of all of them has to be Clever Cube. I love the different bonus actions you can take, specifically this middle area here. This bonus allows you to set a die to a specific value. And all of these mini games really rely on having specific values. So it even feeds into that push your luck a bit more, but gives you that control with being able to set dice to specific numbers. All in all, the entire That's Pretty Clever series offers combo driven risk management dice placement with a huge amount of variety in the different boards, as well as the different mini games and bonuses they provide. So that's my number eight. That's pretty clever. My number seven goes to Sleeping Gods, where you play as the crew of the Manticore who have found yourself on the Wandering Sea. The gods of the islands are sleeping and you must awake them by finding and collecting their totems and at the end of the journey use those totems to awaken them and hopefully return home. Sleeping Gods puts you in control of a large crew of characters, each with their own special abilities, upgrade paths, and their own ways to interact with the story as well as the creatures that you may fight. Sleeping Gods features a simplified round structure where you'll take a single ship action with a small bit of worker placement, gaining resources, resolve an event from your event deck, and then take two actions on the main game board, moving around, exploring the area you're at, or interacting with a market or port that you also could potentially be at. The game is over when you've ran through the event deck three times, so your time is limited. You are always pressured to be doing something actively, not wasting time, and continuing to explore. One of my favorite parts about this game is the escalation and discovery of items and abilities throughout the game. At the start of the game, you'll only have access to a few items, and you'll get to know them pretty well. You'll be using them a lot to refresh your characters, retry at tests, or gain new ability cards. After after you go exploring or after you've gone shopping at the market, usually you'll bring back an ability in the form of an item or a character upgrade. By the very nature of the game, each time you gain an ability, you're going to read it, understand it, and use it promptly. And as the game progresses, you'll gain more and more abilities and items, and you'll understand each of them as they enter your arsenal. This leads to a phenomenon where at the end of the game, you'll have a gigantic tableau of cards and effects that you can activate, but because you've been progressively getting them throughout your campaign, you will know exactly what they do and know which knobs to turn for each different situation. Aside from the incredible mechanisms that tie the entire experience together, the narrative and storytelling and world building of Sleeping Gods is one of the best. Sleeping Gods is my go-to large campaign game that I compare everything else that I play to. I love taking charge of the ship, putting the soundtrack on in the background, and seeing what new adventures the Wandering Sea has for me. So that is my number seven, Sleeping Gods. My number six goes, to underwater cities, a game where you're going to be creating habitats for humanity underwater. You'll be creating these cities through a worker placement system. You'll play a card that matches a colored space, and you'll take the action of that space as well as if the colors match, you'll take the action of the card as well. And these cards come in all sorts of different flavors. You have instant effects that trigger one time. You have continuous effects that will always be happening, actions that you'll need to go to other spaces to use, end game scoring, and things that will trigger during the production phase. On top of these varied effects, the strength of the cards escalates as the rounds progress. After a production phase of occurs, you'll draw three new cards from the new era deck, discard down to three, and then proceed to the next round. These new cards will be stronger than the others, and you'll feel a sense of progression as you now have more resources and more abilities to choose from. I love the engine building that comes from playing these cards, and I love how it ties to the worker placement system as a whole. Every time you use an action space, you want to be pairing up a card, but this adds a great twist because the action spaces differ in power. The orange actions are very strong, but the orange cards are not very strong. The red ones are in the middle, and then the green actions are very weak, while the green cards are very strong. You always have the choice of going to a space and playing an off-colored card and not getting that card's effect if you really need that space's ability. I love this choice and the solo mode adds an additional twist where at the end of every round, if you haven't gone up on the Federation track, which is the turn order track in the main game, then you have to discard a card from the top of the deck and it reveals a new space that the AI is going to block for you in the next round. So another layer is added to this choice where am I going to prioritize going up on this track or do I push my luck to prevent the AI from blocking 
blocking me from another potential space that I might want to use in the next round. And to top it all off, you'll be drawing new cards from the top of the deck at the end of every turn, so you'll always be able to make a new tactical decision. Underwater Cities provides tough decisions, engine building in the form of the cards and the buildings you'll be creating, push your luck, worker placement system, and the incredible action card pairing system that drives the entire experience. So that is my number six underwater cities. And my number five goes to Bullet Heart, where you're going to be protecting the Earth as a mighty heroine from evil invaders and their assault of bullets. Bullet Heart's core system revolves around the bullets themselves, these discs that you'll be drawing from the bag and place it in front of you. Whenever you place it, it has the potential to actually make it all the way down these columns and it hits you. If you lose all your health, you're out. But have no fear, you have ways to mitigate this with your action point system, where you can modify and change your sight, as well as these pattern cards, which are the core way that you're going to be removing the bullets from your sight here. Whenever you remove them, you'll be sending them to your enemy, the boss. Now there's two main ways to play the solo mode of this. You have the original way where it's a score attack, you're just playing to try to get the highest score, or you can fight the bosses. On the back of each heroine, they have their own boss side, which have their own pattern cards, which become a new layer of difficulty for you. Not only are you trying to match up the different bullets onto your sight in order to clear them and send them to the enemy, but you're also trying to satisfy the enemy's condition, because if you don't, something negative will happen. So it's a balance and a push your luck system of how how can I make sure that the bullets are organized in front of me to satisfy my patterns, but also the opponents, but also so that they don't hit me and I lose all my life and get booted out of the game. I love the risk management of this game as the things that you're going to be using to actually overcome your obstacles are the things that can potentially knock you out. On top of the innovated systems and pattern building, the icing on the cake here is the asymmetry of the characters. Each heroine will have something that makes them unique. Maybe they're pattern cards or a different layout. Maybe they have ways that they can and push bullets that no other character can. Maybe they have some protection built in, or they have bullets that are going to go onto their site and become new abilities that you can maneuver with your different action points or pattern cards. The challenge is present, and you can scale your difficulty as you see fit based on the character pairings that you yourself get to choose. I love that the personality translates from the heroines to the bosses as well, and make for exciting showdowns between the different characters. Bullet Hearts asymmetry, patterns, push your luck, and risk management systems as well as its modes of play, make it a game that's going to change the way you think about board gaming, and it deserves a spot in your collection. This is my number five, Bullet Heart. Number four goes to Hadrian's Wall, where you play as Roman leaders constructing the Hadrian's Wall. You'll be trying to fortify it as well as develop your citizenry while defending it from the barbarian picks that will be attacking and invading. In this game, you have these two large roll and write style sheets. You'll be revealing cards to gain a bunch of resources, and then you'll also be picking from two objective cards. And these objective cards will determine how you score additional points at the end of the game, as well as give you some iconography, as well as more resources that you'll get to use in that round. Now, the solo mode itself has you playing basically the standard game, so there's no big changes here. But the greatest thing here that it adds is a solo campaign. And these are going to be some small rules tweaks that are going to make it so that each time you play, you'll have a new objective, new rules, new twists and turns, and new ways that you approach the game design as a whole. I love this system because not only do you have different rules, goals, but you also have an additional challenge for added difficulty that gives you an actual reward that you can use in the next challenge. This makes it so that you can play as much as you want. You can try to speed run it and get it done as quickly as possible. Can you get all the challenges? Can you get the higher scores? You can customize your experience as you see fit to either have a casual experience or to have a long run campaign where you try to min max and maximize your score. In tandem with the objectives, the solo Solo campaign offers ways to explore the game's large sheets and use your citizenry in ways that you may not have thought possible before. And I have to mention the satisfying feeling at the start of every round where you'll reveal a card from the pick deck and you'll get showered in resources. Not only do you get the resources from your objective cards, your setup rewards, these cards here, but you can also spec into different production buildings that will give you even more. I love this sensation and this constant reward of getting all this stuff and figuring 
figuring out how to best use it. And that shower of resources does not stop at the start of each round. Every time you take an action, you have the potential of unlocking an additional bonus, whether that be in the form of victory points on your different tracks, or as you can see on these citizen tracks, just more resources to do more things. You can always find a way to do something in this game by looking at the various options available to you and seeing which paths can give you a successive amount of bonus action after action after action. Hadrian's Walls, plethora of choices, objective cards, juggling of different systems, as well as the showering of resources tied in to the solo campaign, provide me with a very challenge paired with a relaxing, satisfying experience. So that is my number four, Hadrian's Wall. And my number three goes to Too Many Bones. This has you playing as a gearlock in the land of Daylor, trying to save the land from a terrible tyrant. You'll be constructing a deck of these adventure cards, some that are specifically for solo modes, which is great because they keep that experience in mind throughout your entire experience. There's no edge cases or anything that you have to work out, it's all presented there for you. You'll go from different mission to mission, and most of these missions will have you fighting some sort of battle on this small tactical grid. You'll use your different dice available to you, your different treasures and items, and this is a game where every battle matters, because after you finish your battles, you'll be able to upgrade your characters. And this is my favorite part about this game. After every single battle, you'll be able to take your different training points and use them to either increase your basic skills, get new abilities and items, and these abilities you can use immediately after you get them. And because those encounters are successive, it's so easy to get the level up, set up the next mission, and then immediately get to see how that power plays out. The flavor and asymmetry of each gear lock is stunning, as they provide unique upgrade paths that you can see with these colored lines. For example, with Nugget here, my favorite character, you can go this purple route for combat proficiency, and then from there you can split off to either get the keen eye ability or locksmith. You have so much choice here as a player based on the gear lock you choose, but also that individual path that you take with each gear lock. There are so many different ways to play each gear lock, and it's up to you how you proceed with it. And to top it all off, Too Many Bones' entire structure is enticing for a solo player. This is an adventure game where you can sit down and have a full-scale adventure. You can make it a large campaign. You can make it a single one-shot adventure. It's up to you how you approach it. Most of the bosses that you'll be fighting have a specific time limit, so you can cater the experience to have an entire adventure, an entire satisfying leveling up experience in one sit down. Too Many Bones is my fantasy adventure game of choice, where I can feel that satisfaction of leveling my characters, using my items, being encouraged to do so, and taking down an ultimate baddie at the end of my adventure. Too Many Bones has it all, with quirky fantasy flavor, tech trees, leveling up, immediate access to those level ups, tactical combat, scenario structure as a whole, I love Too Many Bones, my number three. And my number two goes to Hollertau, my favorite Euro-style solo game. This is another worker placement game where you play as farmers. However, your whole entire goal here is to collect enough resources to push these different buildings on your board. Every time the round increases, you'll have to pay more resources. But when you do, it'll give you more access to more workers in future rounds. It features a lot of intuitive and interesting systems, including a crop rotation system, aging sheep, as well as a brilliant worker placement system where every time you place a worker, you put it on this bottom row. And if you want to take that action in the future, you're going to have to place more workers and more workers until it's eventually full and blocked out. At the start of each round, you'll clear off the top row of a single section of the board, so it's all about timing and being able to efficiently use the action spaces at your disposal. But all of these systems are united with a single mechanism, and this is my favorite part about the game, and these are the cards. There are going to be four different types of cards you'll be getting. Different income cards, endgame scoring cards, as well as these gateway cards and these hat cards. And these two specific types of cards give you different ways to generate resources, one-time effects, different abilities, ways to break the game, and ways to use the systems that are present in the game in interesting ways. At the start of each game, you'll select a single deck of these unique gateway and hat cards. And you can mix and match them with the different sets, providing brand new experiences but because each of the cards are unique, you are never going to have the same game twice. And in addition to the creativity and interesting ways that the mechanisms are employed in these cards, you also have the flexibility of timing with them. Every single one of these cards can be played at 
any time. And I love that it gives you as the player so much agency and choice as to when the best time is to play these cards. Do you save it for a key pivotal moment? Do you use the resources to plant and then harvest and immediately spend them to achieve another card? Do you play this thing in the middle of another action or the middle of one of your production phases? It's up to you how you proceed with your actions. Some of my favorite things to do in this game are just using the action spaces that let me draw more cards to see how efficiently I can combo them and play them out in front of me. This dopamine hit of successfully meeting the criteria on your different mini objective cards is so incredibly satisfying and it's what keeps pulling me back to the game. I love playing out these cards in front of me using the effects in interesting ways and propelling myself forward to get my next highest score. I love the persistent puzzle of the cards and how they tie into all aspects of the game and push me to try to play as many as possible for successive benefits. Holler Tao's resources, farming, and worker system are interwoven perfectly into the objective cards that propel the entire experience. So that's my number two, Holler Tao. And my number one solo board game for 2022 goes to Marvel Champions, my favorite game of all time. This has you playing as Marvel superheroes, and you'll be facing some form of villain in their own unique scenario. The villain will have a scheme that they're trying to complete, and it's up to you to take them out before they do. You'll choose your hero, who has 15 cards that are assigned to them. For example, Thor here always has Lady Sith, Defender of the Nine Realms for Asgard, Hammer Throw, Asgard itself, and of course, Mjolnir. But then you'll also pair that hero with a specific aspect of your choosing. This can be something in the form of aggression, something that's a bit more on the punchy side, leadership, where you're commanding all of these allies to fight for you, or protection, where you're able to defend and heal a lot. Or lastly, you could be justice, where you're able to thwart the schemes that the villains are trying to finish. After assembling your deck, you'll take on the villain, and every single turn presents you with a puzzle. Every single card has a cost associated with it. For example, for Asgard here, costs a single resource to play. Every other card in your hand has resources that they provide. For example, Defender of the Nine Realms is zero cost to play, but you can use it as a strength resource to pay for your other cards. So you're constantly having to look at the resources you have available to you and how to approach the different situations in front of you. And this leads to another thing I love, the constant choice between immediate threats and future engine building. Rhino is here. He has all of these schemes that he's trying to complete. Do you focus on those or do you focus on building up your own character? The choices always yours and it's up to you to find the balance between those two things. Marvel Champions features asymmetric heroes that all have their own unique way that they proceed with their powers and abilities. For example, Iron Man here has a vast amount of pieces of armor that he'll be assembling throughout this scenario. I love this because you have so many different knobs that you can turn and each character uses the core systems of the game in very unique and exciting ways. I love that you're constantly turning knobs in this game. You're using a small effect to trigger another effect, to draw a Card, to play something, to provide a resource for another ability, and hopefully take out that villain in the process. And those powers and abilities are set up during that deck building process. But because of Marvel Champion's structure of pick a hero, pick an aspect, it's so easy to actually assemble a deck and get started playing. Very similarly to Too Many Bones, Marvel Champions is a scenario driven game at its heart. You'll pick your villain, you'll pick your hero, and then you'll fight. But you can make it a campaign if you want to with the inclusion of the campaign experience expansion boxes. Each scenario that you play is going to push the envelope of creativity. From fighting the basic rhino to get you introduced to the different aspects of the game as a whole, or something as crazy as Kang the Conqueror, who's going to be sending you out through time and summoning your evil nemesis to fight during the later half of the game. And Marvel Champions release structure is based on the LCG model, but it's done in a way that's consumable and that you can go at your own pace. You get the core box, which has so many heroes, that you'll have a lot of time to enjoy and play them and see how they match up with the different villains in that core box. And when you're ready, you can move on in any order that you see fit. If you want to skip Green Goblin for now, just go straight to Captain America. Heck, you can go all the way to the Guardians boxes and start working with them. You can pick the themes and the characters that you want to explore, but the more you get, the more options that are present to you. And if you're going at your own pace here, you'll be able to get comfortable in the different library of cards that you'll have assembled. If I had to claim any game as my lifestyle game, it would be Marvel Champions for sure. I love that I can just pick up a deck of cards, play a scenario, or I can spend my time to really think and craft a deck and try something new. 
This is a game that I play not only for a challenge, but for comfort, for relaxing. I put on some music. I can watch a video. I can just enjoy my time with Marvel Champions and save the day as my favorite heroes. Marvel Champions, puzzle turns, immediate threat versus engine building, powers and abilities, all the noms you get to turn, the deck construction, the scenario gameplay, and the model as a whole make it my favorite solo board game of all time. And that's the list. Those are my top 10 solo board games of all time and that puts a wrap on our top 50 solo board games of all time the 2022 edition thank you so much for watching and if you watch the entire list series thank you so much for your continuous support and for being here this whole time this was a blast to make i just love talking about my favorite solo games what are your favorite solo games do you agree with any of the ones that i mentioned on this list are you surprised at any of the games that i mentioned here did something not appear on the top 50 that you think should have i'd love to hear what you think but thank you so much for watching and one more time if you haven't subscribed to the channel already please make sure that you do it is the best way to help us grow and thank you again to all of my subscribers all my patrons thank you everybody for being here and supporting myself and side game llc thank you so much and thank you so much for watching side game strong